Hush crowd. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible to have any more fun than we're having here. Indie Sports Show Live, all over Facebook, YouTube. You can find us at the uh, IndieSportsShow.com. Link and share. Go back and see who we've had here with us uh, throughout last weekend and, of course, today and tomorrow. We're in the Champions Pavilion. We're in the Travel Cafe. we got a big crowd out here today. And there's a reason we have a big crowd right now because... One of the people that I was most looking forward to having some time with was Melissa Bachman. So great to have you. Well, thank you for having me. I sure appreciate it. Well, you um, have a very unique role. You're doing all kinds of seminars out here. You're doing one on women and kids in the outdoors. We're going to get to how you kind of started in this this business on self-filming. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're doing a round table. What aren't you doing while you're out here? Well, I'm also doing one on rattling and decoying whitetails, which has been a huge hit. People love that. And people see some of the whitetail shows, and they see you decoying, and they say, I need to know more information. So this seminar is all about that. So social media, of course, that's what we're doing here, Sports Show Live. Big part of what you do. Yes. Uh, Facebook, over 50,000 followers. Instagram, I don't even know how many, but no. I know you do. Quite a few. You... Uh, publish some great stuff, really quality stuff that you should be very proud of, but that's kind of how you got into this business is the, the technical side. Yes. Why don't you share with people how you got started? Well, you know, I really got started in the technical side of editing and producing shows. So I went out, I have a double major in television production, and I got done with college and I thought, I'm going to have so many job offers, I'm not going to know what to do. Wrong. Well, I sent out 74 resume reels, not one person wanted to hire me. And I thought, now what? So I went back and went to the number one place where I wanted to work and said, I'll work for free. And they said, OK, when can you start? And I said, I'll start tomorrow. I said, I don't care what you need. If I'm sweeping floors, whatever it is, be happy to do it just to get my foot in the door. So that's what I did for four months. I was a TV producer, an editor, and just went out and filmed everybody else. I did that actually for four months. Then they hired me full time. I think they felt bad for me. I was driving 150 miles a day back and forth to go work for free. And then I'd have to waitress at night just to get enough money to pay for my gas. Um, so after four months, they hired me full time. And for the next four years, I was a cameraman. And I filmed people all over the country. And it was really great because I got to know all the behind the scenes stuff, get to learn so much. Because I grew up in central Minnesota. I hadn't done a lot of these different hunts. So it was a lot of fun to be able to do that but then I wanted to be in front of the camera and of course people don't necessarily want to give up their spot so I would actually film my hunts on my own get everything edited together and wait till one of the guys didn't have a, sho a show done on a Friday and I'd say well you can have this one for free and they started running them and that's how I got my start in front of the camera so it's just kind of fun now I own Winchester Deadly Passion I am the full production company on it I do all the editing and we're now in the ninth season so it's really fun to see all your hard work pay off and and to be able to do what you love my goal was always to hunt every single day and well some years I hunt 320 330 days a year so I think that's close enough to every single day <laughs> You know, it's interesting when you get to know people in this environment, there's the camera that people see you, but you were uh, a straight-A student. Yes, I was. You uh, were on the track team, captain yes. of your track team. You played the saxophone, and uh, you were a pole vaulter. Yes, I actually went to college and was a pole vaulter on their track Tell team. Tell us about your pole vault. Well, I love pole vaulting. In fact, I actually took all my poles and I wrapped them in camouflage. And uh, the kids, the people would see them like, what on earth is this? And it was just a fun way for me. I was a hunter. I loved to hunt. Um, I actually had a work permit all through high school where I didn't have to go to school till 10 a.m. because my parents said I was providing food for the family. So it was just an awesome thing to be able to do. Um, but it's just one more way that I was able to showcase my love for the outdoors. So you got started in, a, in an outdoor family very yes. young, and I read a story somewhere that 
you, you had to do push-ups for a year just to be able to pull a bow back. I was kind of a run. So at 12 years old in Minnesota, you had to be able to pull 40 pounds. Well, I couldn't do that yet. So for that whole year, I was doing push-ups to get strong enough. And now I have my bow set at 64 pounds, but it's because I've been shooting since I was a young kid. I started shooting a bow at five years old, but by 12, I was able to go out and take my first deer with a bow and arrow, and that was awesome. So we've talked a little bit about social media and that can be a double-edged sword, can't yes, it? Yes, it can, of course. And you've been um, on the not-so-friendly side, receive, receiving end of some not-so-friendly stuff. How does that make you feel? Well, the one thing I always try to remind people is as hunters in the hunting community, we really need to stick together. And that unity is so important. And a lot of times people think, well, I'm nice to other people. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, what it comes down to is I want to make sure that people understand that we all want to be supportive of each other. That means having comments, being nice to each other. And you'd think that would just be a common sense thing. But for some reason, unfortunately, it is not. So a lot of times I try to remind people to really stick together. Together. If you see posts where people are being, you know, not so nice to each other, especially within our hunting community, stand up for one another. Say, hey, we're in it together. And, you know, sometimes people think, well, I was just joking, and I hear that all the time. But it doesn't come across as joking, and I don't care. I have thick skin. You're not going to offend me. But I try to remind people, hey, there's new people getting into this sport and what we want to do is make them feel welcome make them feel like we're a nice community together so that's something that I try to always reiterate is you know why don't we really stick together we're always going to have the antis and the people who don't like hunting but when they see a divide within our own community that's what we need to fix and that's what hurts hunters I couldn't agree with you more and we've had this conversation in other segments uh, Chuck Adams was just here he's he's been on that side of criticism too I want to switch the angle just a little bit. I know that part of your role here at the Boat Sport and Travel Show is to being a mentor and to encourage women and younger people to get into the sport. And I've seen a lot more women hosts of outdoor shows. That has to make you feel proud that your message is getting received. Absolutely. You know, and the best thing that you can do is get more people involved because I was lucky enough, I grew up in a family where my mom hunted. So I was able to look up to her, but there's families that they don't have that. So they look to television, they look to YouTube to see people. And it's so nice to see more and more women out there. Some women are really hardcore hunters, some are not. And that is okay. You can mix it up. And sometimes my mom, she likes, she's more of a fair weather hunter. If it's raining, cold, snowy, she might not want to go out there. But there's people out there like that, so it's good to have a wide variety to look at. And I think it's great to have all sorts of different women and getting involved. And yes, it makes me proud to see more and more people getting involved. Unfortunately, I've seen the, the other side of this too, because you've received criticism because you're out there 300 days a year. Oh yeah. There's a double standard when your critics or will say, well, you should be home, you have a new son. Yep. I, I, it, drives, it has to drive you mad. Well, it's one of those things where I try to remind people, we're out there, we're living this outdoor lifestyle, embrace it. Our family, we bring my son, he's six months old. Um, my husband and I will take him along. My parents come on some of the hunts, so they're watching him during the day. I get to have him at night. This is what we do. This is the lifestyle he's growing up with, and he's going to love it. And I promise, it, yes, some babies need a, a very nice routine in their home. He doesn't get that. He gets to come with us hunting and he will experience things that some kids never would have imagined. So I think it's really a beneficial thing and again the biggest thing is to support one another. We do a pretty good job in our hunting community of eating our own, don't yes. we? Yes, <laughs> unfortunately and that, that is, is true. that is something I've hosted Indiana Outdoors Radio for 20 years mm -hmm. and we talk about this a lot. It may not be for me but even Chuck Adams just said if it's legal and you're having fun at it, who am I to judge? Right. There's a lot of judges out there of what we do, and we need to stick together. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yep, and I just think that it's important, and it's important to really embrace each other because if you think about it, you want to join something new and you don't know much about it, and you see a bunch of people fighting from within, it doesn't seem like a very welcoming community. So we really need to make sure that we're supporting each other so that people coming in feel welcomed and feel like they're not going to do something and get a bunch of criticism for it. Right. You uh, have traveled the world. Uh, just earlier this week, you were out in New Mexico and you yes. you shot your Udad. Yep. 
They and shot an Audad, or Audad. it's a Barbary sheep in uh, New Mexico, Audad in Texas. Oh, okay. But they're a cool animal, and in February is when they're open. And so there's not a lot of other seasons open. So I decided to put these two together. I shot my sheep in the morning, and I was here in the evening. So awesome deal. It's a beautiful thing. Love technology and love yes. transportation. <laughs> so you <clears throat> have an interesting, if I had asked you what your, your dream hunt would be, that's kind of an interesting story for you. Why alligators? I love alligators. And, you know, I think part of it is because I love to hunt, but I love people. And I love enjoying hunts where you can have that social aspect of it. And alligator hunting is just that. You get to go out. You're at night. It's something that, as a young girl in Minnesota, never did I think I'd be able to go after alligators. And I also like it because it gets new people involved. Young kids will see my television show, watch it on YouTube, meet me at the show, and they see alligators and they're like, I want to go do that. And I love being able to to get people involved in things that maybe they never thought would be possible. But you talk to all these kids at the show, it's amazing to see, and they say, I want to go do that. So that's one of the reasons I love alligator hunting. Swimming with the sharks? Yes, I have not got to swim with the sharks yet, but that is still on my bucket list, and someday I'll get to do that. So you have a dog that travels with you, pork chop. Yes. Is he here? Pork Chop did not get to make the trip, unfortunately, because I was in New Mexico hunting before here. They actually had a big snowstorm hitting while I was there. So I decided to leave Pork Chop home because she doesn't have a lot of fur and she gets pretty cold and uh, I don't like to leave her back at the lodge. So it was just too chilly to take her, but she travels everywhere with me. She's got an awesome Instagram she page. She has an Instagram page. Pork Chop was here and she poses with all the animals I shoot and she's very treat motivated. So that's why she does <laughs> such a good job on there best piece of hunting advice you've received? The best piece of hunting advice I've ever received probably has to do with really understanding and learning on every single hunt. You go all over the country, you meet new people, everybody has something that you can pick up from them. You never know it all. Nobody will ever know it all, whether the best hunter in the world, you can always learn new things. And, and that's what I'm always trying to do is just pick up little things along the way, every single hunt, and it makes you a better person and a better hunter. Who would you most like to hunt with? Who would I most like to hunt with? Well, I guess if I had to pick somebody, I'd probably go back in time and hunt with my grandfather. Um, he passed away before I was ever born, but he was such a Winchester advocate. And my dad still to this day says, if your grandpa knew that you were representing Winchester all the time, he would be so happy and so proud. So that's probably who I would hunt with. So I've revealed an awful lot of things that people may not have known about you. What's something that people don't know about you, something that you like to communicate when you're on stage or writing articles or producing TV shows? Well, one of the biggest things is I'm always trying to get new people involved. And there's so much that can be learned through hunting. And so I guess for people that are out there, not only to get their own children involved in hunting, but I want to remind people, get others involved. In our community, we take four or five new kids a year out. And it's so important because you're getting people that are not exposed to hunting. Word of mouth is the best way to get new hunters involved. So by bringing new people in, well, they tell their friends and then they may not have parents who would have got them involved, but by bringing them out, taking them hunting, and then bringing back that process game so that they can cook it in their home, I think it's one of the most powerful things that you can do to really recruit new hunters. So you're uh, off to home state of Minnesota for an expo up there, I believe, where you're doing yes. some sessions. Yes. Glad to be home. Well, I actually live in South Dakota now, so we've moved recently. Okay. Um, but Minnesota is my home. That's where my parents live. And we're building a new home in South Dakota. My husband's a game warden out there, so there we you. live out there. And so I love, love South Dakota. Lots of great hunting all around us. And Been in Aberdeen about 15 years in a row, pheasant yeah. hunting Very out there. Very nice. It's yeah, it's place. a wonderful place. It's just a thrill to have you with me. I know that your favorite. You can that take is, that for your, you can take the Diet Mountain Dew awesome. back <laughs> on your walk back over to do your seminars and we want to make sure you have plenty of time to get over there. Well, thank Michelle you Bachman's much. been our guest. It's been fantastic to have everybody be a part of the uh, 65th annual Ford Boat Sport and Travel Show. Travel Cafe. We're here in the Champions Pavilion. You're not going to want to go anywhere. We're just getting started and I expect that you'll be back for our next one coming up real soon. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you, especially for this. <laughs>